I'd like to start with health. And uh, I am a pain doctor. And um, it all starts with nutrition. Now, I call myself an accidental pain doctor because I really never intended to go into pain medicine when I started. Not that I intended not to, I just didn't have an intention to do that. I was a primary care practitioner to start. And, but I had known pain from early childhood. And it wasn't any major disease, it wasn't any major condition. Um, so it never took a real form, but I was aware of these episodes through my life and just had to somehow figure out how to deal with them. And the way in which I dealt with them was through what I eat, drink, think, feel, and do. Lifestyle is what I had found for my own coping mechanisms. Um, and then I, I went to medical school, uh, conventional medical school, and I um, uh, learned all about all the different medical solutions to everything, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I had an affinity still for uh, things that, uh, that, were, that affected people's lifestyles. And so when I would see chronic pain patients, they tended to be the ones that had the fewest answers out there in the community, in the medical community <clears throat> that I was part of. So I would um, refer my chronic pain patients, uh, trying to find solutions to what I thought was wrong with them, and I wouldn't get answers back from the specialists that I was referring to. So I would dig deeper into the literature. And I ended up coming back to the things that had helped me, which is lifestyle. And so that's been my path. Um, and I want to talk to you about not just nutrition in, um, in pain medicine, as though it's another drug. Um, I, I agree with Dr. Bongiorno, we can't just treat supplements uh, and nutrients is just another drug, because that's equally a non-holistic approach. But I do want to talk to you a little bit about this uh, wonderful book. Uh, this is by Thomas Kuhn, and it's about the structure of scientific revolutions. And um, I want to paraphrase something for you. It's all about how do you change uh, science. And of course, medical science is what we're trying to change. Now, he's the man who came up with the word paradigms uh, for fixed scientific beliefs that are prevalent. And what he says is that much of the success of science derives from the willingness of scientists to defend the assumption that they know how the world works. If necessary, they will defend it at considerable cost. And certainly, we see that in the medical system. Prevailing science often suppresses novel findings that don't fit the paradigm because they are subversive. So I think that's what we are. We are subversive. Uh, so I'm very happy to talk to you about a few things. Well, my focus in our program is mostly headache and facial pain syndromes. And uh, when I was considering this discussion, what I really wanted to do is to make sure you leave not just with egg-headed concepts of pain and neurologic-based issues, but actually with a, with a toolbox you can take with you, things that you can do in your practice that can be very helpful that perhaps you haven't considered along the way. So that's the full intent of this, uh, and then um, certainly there'll be time for questions afterwards, or if not, I'll be outside the, the lecture hall. Uh, disclosure, so I, I am uh, a consultant and shareholder for one company only, uh, and that's one that makes a device to treat chronic headache, which um, I'm not covering in this lecture. And the first thing to start off with is what is migraine? And I promised I wouldn't be too egg-headed about this stuff, and certainly you've heard many lectures about migraine or headache before. Uh, but really it's important just to cover some key pieces because we're going to come back to this later in our discussion. So migraine is an integrated experience of the nervous system. And uh, if you think about someone who's never had migraine before in their lives, I like to ask them the question, have you ever had a hangover headache? Has anyone here ever had a hangover headache before? Just a few hands, I find that hard to believe. But if you can consider that concept, think of the fact that if you have a hangover headache, you prefer to be in a dark, quiet room, 
You prefer to not have your friend scream your name really loud. Sometimes there's some nausea, and there's a throbbing headache experience with this. And uh, technically, alcohol-induced headache is alcohol-induced migraine, just like lots of other life chaos can introduce migraine to people. And the thing about migraine is we all in this room have the ability to have migraine because it's a trigeminal nervous system reflex. It's just some people trigger that reflex much easier than other people do. And also our environment or things we do to our bodies can bring out that reflex just like other people do too. And it's characterized by headache, but you can certainly have migraine features without headache. It has a bunch of associated symptoms like light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, nausea. And it's a habitual experience where that the more you irritate the nervous system and trigger this reflex that we call as migraine, the more you're likely to have it down the road. It can build up on itself. So a few things about this. The lining of the brain becomes inflamed during migraine. And one of the coolest things I'd want to mention, especially considering Dr. Katz's lecture from earlier, is that if you take a rat and expose its intestines and expose its meninges, then you pour inflammatory material on the intestines itself, the meninges become inflamed. And you can actually watch the sterile inflammation of the lining of the brain occur from irritating the gut uh, itself. And if you consider everything that McDonald's does or that Burger King does or any of these companies that do all kinds of wonderful things to our intestines, imagine what that does to the lining of the brain. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. My name is uh, Dr. Dar. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in private practice in Covington, Louisiana, which is about 40 minutes outside of New Orleans. So I've been in private practice for 23 years, uh, doing traditional orthopedic surgery, uh, a lot of total hips, total knees, total shoulders, knee arthroscopy, and then some trauma fracture work. I've been very successful with, with these patients. However, over time, I felt there was a missing link in the care of the orthopedic patient. You know, traditional orthopedic treatment, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications, steroid injections, bracing, um, and then they didn't get better, and then surgical intervention. Nothing wrong with that, but I felt that we could offer more options to the uh, patient. About six years ago, I started instituting uh, stem cell treatment in my practice. Started off with platelet-rich plasma, then evolved to bone marrow uh, stem cells, and then uh, fat uh, also fat graft. So I'm pleased to be here today to uh, share with you some of my results on my interim analysis of the uh, combined cell therapy for the treatment of pain and function associated with osteoarthritis. My talk's about 20 minutes, and then we can open it up for questions, make it a, a real interactive uh, discussion here. The purpose of today's presentation, to define the components of combined cell therapy and explain how they work and discuss my current application of these components and the evaluation of the patient responses to this treatment with regard to the symptoms of osteoarthritis. I have no potential conflicts with this presentation. Osteoarthritis is characterized by inflammation in the joint, which can cause pain, swelling, and stiffness, amongst other symptoms. It is most common in those over age 50 and is most frequently caused from degeneration over time due to wear and tear of the joint. When comparing a normal knee with a knee with osteoarthritis, there is typically a lot of inflammation. Bone spurs may be present, articular cartilage can break down, uh, exposing the bone. The current treatment of osteoarthritis includes lifestyle modifications such as minimizing activities that aggravates the symptoms, switching to low impact activities and losing weight. Physical therapy is often prescribed to increase the range of motion and flexibility, along with strengthening the muscles in the leg to take stress off the joint. Some assistive, assistive devices may be used to help get around. Heat and ice can help alleviate the symptoms in addition to medication injections. Common injections include steroid, hyaluronic acid, and other visco supplementation. Alternative therapies such as acupuncture can often be used also. There are surgical options available to treat osteoarthritis, including arthroscopy, synovectomy. Osteotomy means cutting the bone and realigning it, and ultimately total joint replacement. These definitely have a role in the treatment of the patient. The key is it's not the only treatment. I have a little bit of a cold. I came from Ann Arbor, Michigan, where my daughter and my uh, 
lovely granddaughter who has a cold who's 18 months old. And so I, if I <coughs> sound a little raspy or I'm coughing, it's, it's a Michigan cough. We have that. So our goals, um, I, will, I would like to discuss very briefly the anti-inflammatory nature of uh, acupuncture. Uh, we'll review microsystems. We'll uh, discuss um, the indications and contraindications for rapid auricular acupuncture, where it came from, what we do. It is, like I said before, it's a specific technique. You have to do it in order for it to work properly and we'll discuss some other conditions. One of the conditions that we, this works extremely well for is for headaches, and I want to see the patients while they're having the headache. We can usually break it within three, with three or four needles. It's really, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, here's some of the variations that we'll, we'll discuss briefly. A migraine headache, smoking cessation, allergy relief, insomnia, vertigo, uh, libido, erectile dysfunction, and menopausal symptoms. Um, so, you know, how does it work? Why does it work? There's, there's huge controversies that have been, you know, throughout the ages. Um, if you look on the internet, there's the science, Center for Science-Based Medicine. It doesn't work for anything. Those of us who've worked with this, I've been doing this since 1990, knows that it, know that it, it works extremely well. I use everything. I do hormone replacement. I do PRP. We do IV therapy. We do acupuncture, so I use it as part of what I do. Um, the original, uh, way back when, um, ancient Chinese, is this the point of view? Yeah. Ancient Chinese um, theories, yin and yang, five elements. There's meridian balance. There's a wonderful uh, physician who just passed away named Richard Tan, who does a balancing technique that is extremely uh, powerful. In the late 70s, Bruce Pomerantz at the University of Toronto uh, developed a, a theory of, uh, he actually was trying to debunk the, uh, the use of acupuncture with, by uh, measuring beta endorphins and actually proved that acupuncture treatments increase, increases beta endorphins in the, brain's, in the brain. Okay, so we're gonna talk today about managing and resolving pain because regardless of your specialty, if you're a neurologist, a family doctor, an orthopedic surgeon, you're going to be dealing in the world of pain. And we know that the dealing with the world of pain hasn't been too successful. We obviously have an opioid epidemic created in part by the pharmaceutical industry and driven through our profession to create addictions throughout the United States and worldwide. So we need a different paradigm. The paradigm we have in place isn't working. Are we going to get stronger opioids that last for longer periods of time? with all the complications associated with it? Or are we gonna take positive steps in our office and as a profession to change the paradigm, to change the face of medicine, to change the face of healing? So we have to think in terms of managing and resolving pain in effective non-pharmacological ways. The kind of things that you're learning at A4M and the types of things we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna describe the relationship between chronic pain and inflammation. It's pretty tough to have pain without inflammation. And even if you have chronic pain, you might not find a lot of inflammatory markers, but you're certainly finding other factors associated with the chronic pain, like ligamentosis tendinosis. We're gonna to start to identify some of those risk factors. So we wanna do a risk factor analysis, as well as asking the patient, what's your level of pain? Something as simple as that. And we're gonna review the research associated with novel vitamin therapies and herbal therapies to downregulate pain, as well as other integrative medicine techniques. This is, in fact, the new paradigm. It needs more support. It needs support at the National Institute of Health. It needs support by the insurance industry. It needs support from the pharmaceutical industry. But the reality is, for that change to take place, just like the changes that are taking place in medical marijuana, that change has to start with each one of us and in turn direct that towards our patients. We're going to discuss also the link between the microbiome and pain, right? So we hear about gut-brain pain relationships. So we're gonna talk about that. So how bad is it? Well, there's 100 million Americans who have chronic pain. That's pretty significant. That's literally one out of every three people has some form of chronic pain. One in 10 Americans have experienced pain every day. And it can be from mild to moderate, but they're experiencing pain on a regular basis. And worldwide, 1.5 billion plus people that have some form of pain and chronic pain. So it's not like we're gonna lack for patients that have this type of 
inflammation, chronic pain, and impairment and disability. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Well, we have to have a different model. That model can't be that you have osteoarthritis of your knee and you have to have a cortisone shot and take NSAIDs. You know, we know the outcomes of those. They don't really work. There's no long-term benefit from doing something like that. We can't take our migraine patients and just give them tryptins on infinitum. Isn't there a reason why the patient's having migraine headaches? A reason why someone has low back pain or chronic digestive episodes? Those are the questions that we need to start asking ourselves. So we move away from the pharmaceutical model that says pain and drugs are synonymous. We, of course, know that that pain just perpetuates the problem. So our unifying feature really is inflammation. So chronic pain, arthritis, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, mental illness is linked to chronic inflammation. Some of the biomarkers that we consider, so when you go to the labs at A4M, they start talking to you about some of the markers that you can look at. So there's serum markers like LPS and C-reactive protein, the IL-6 and 8. These are some of the markers that you can consider with your patient. But don't forget to treat the patient because you might have normal markers, yet the patient has significant pain. Maybe chronic back pain, psoriatic arthritis, autoimmune diseases. So there appears to be a link between biomarkers, inflammation, and disease, without a doubt. So we need to think about what are those triggers. So when you have a patient that comes into you on Monday morning, and they say, you know, I have chronic neck and back pain, I have digestive upsets, I have neuropathy in my feet, I have migraine headaches, I have trigeminal neuralgia pain, you need to think about what are the triggers of that, as opposed to taking your fingers and writing a script and say, you know, I'll see you six months later. Those are the patients that become into the chronic opioid process. Well, the American diet itself is inflammatory. So if you want to get sick, eat the American diet. Eat anything with the American diet, the Mediterranean diet, the caveman diet, you know, high protein, low carbohydrate. Eat something other than the American diet. 